Hi. Just realized, and I haven't hardly talked this morning, so uh, hopefully my voice is ready. I'm Cynthia Allen, and I hope you're going to be joining me this morning, or maybe you'll be watching it on replay. I'm going to talk about the pain puzzle. Pain, particularly chronic pain, has been something that science has been working hard. Researchers have been working hard to understand. You know, we've had lots of ideas about pain over the, uh, my lifetime. And uh, by the way, if you are here and you want to just pop over to StreamYard in the description and just put in your name, it will allow me to see your name if you say hi or you ask a question or make comments. If you want to stay anonymous, that's fine too. But it's nice when I see people. It's good, good to know I'm not by myself here. Uh, and so pain, uh, I think, you know, most of us think about pain in the context of chronic pain or a pain that lasts longer than we would like it to last. But of course, we we know that pain is super important, right? We have to have pain in order to stay safe. Anyone who does not have pain, ability to sense pain, pain receptors is in a lot of trouble. It's difficult to get through a day, a single day without hurting yourself in maybe some catastrophic way. So we know that we need pain. We also know that uh, a little like trauma, I wouldn't, if you didn't see the talk I did yesterday on trauma, you might want to find that out. We're wired to notice things that hurt. And we're not so much wired to notice things that are pleasurable or enjoyable. Uh, it takes maybe it, it's just faster, right? The pain signals come through so much faster. It takes such a much smaller threshold for us to notice something that doesn't feel good than it takes for us to notice something that was really pleasurable. Hey, Christine, glad you're joining me. And um, so when we talk about chronic pain, we have to really start, I think, with understanding that we are wired to notice pleasure sure, to notice things that are easy, sure. But most of that during the day will go under the radar for us. Uh, but where pain will tend to be, be brought back up to the top of it over and over and over again. Well, thanks, Kathy. I know you've got a busy day ahead seeing clients doing this Feldenkrais thing we do, don't it, don't you? Yeah. So we we have a, a particular challenge then if we're wired to notice pain more that and that must mean all pain is telling us something super important. I think it is possible that it is. Now the neuros, neuroscience says, uh, no, it doesn't. It starts to produce erroneous measure uh, signals. And I, I agree with that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go to another level of maybe what it might be helping us signal. So because we're wired to notice more pain than pleasure or ease, uh, it's very easy for the, the neuroplasticity of our brain to get uh, wired in to sending pain messages. And so we believe that, and I think it's going to be true, I feel really confident that we're going to be true, it's going to be true that within a pretty short period of time, the brain now starts to go searching for pain. What's wrong? 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 Uh, and that means that sometimes it's asking what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, and finding pain, 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 when there's not anything urgent happening in our system. Now, this is a change from first we went through the whole phase where particularly women who seem to have more problems with chronic pain than men. I'm not really sure if the research is going to prove that out in the long run uh, because there's just so many things that are hidden with men that are not as easy to find uh, around problems and emotions. But it used to be that women were hysterical. Whenever women had problems, they had anxiety and they were hysterical. And it was just all in their head. And we went through that phase. It lasted, I would say, quite a very long time. Uh, we also have phases that are related to race. So white women would be taken more seriously than black women. 
So we're still struggling with the race issues, the, the research on even physicians who pride themselves on not making different decisions based on race, find out that they are making different decisions based on race. So that's really pretty shocking how deeply ingrained uh, some of these ideas are around uh, vulnerabilities and who is quotes more vulnerable or less vulnerable or more likely to be seeking drugs or more likely to be just hysterically anxious or et cetera. So there's a lot of work yet to be done uh, in terms of raising our consciousness and our actual ability to make good decisions in the healthcare world. So we went through that phase. We're still somewhat in that phase, although we then went through a period of like, don't let people be in pain at all. Give them as much drugs as they really absolutely have to have. And we saw that this oxycodone uh, thing that was actually driven by the people selling these drugs getting everybody, putting everybody constantly on a pain rating scale and making sure people didn't have pain uh, in the healthcare system actually backfired. And now we're at the point where we're going, oh, okay, it's, it's some kind of combination. I think the research is now starting to understand it's some kind of combination of how we think about ourselves and our capacity how we get trained by difficult circumstances in our life to notice pain and then to keep searching for it more and more and more and to become scareder and scareder and scareder. That's really not a great word. More fearful, more fearful, more fearful. So um, it's going to be that, but it's going to also be that and I, I know this is going to be a hard sell because the science says that, you know, MRIs don't, don't predict what causes pain and, oh, posture doesn't predict what causes pain, bad posture. Oh, uh, how you walk, it doesn't predict what causes pain. But I got to tell you, how you use yourself for anyone who specializes in helping people with how they use yourselves it absolutely is a contributor to pain, how you use yourself as a contributor to pain. So when people come to my classes or people come to see me privately, um, privately, I have a couple more options, right? Because I'm doing hands-on work. So I get to compare a little bit more. And there can be people who come in that have had pain for a really, really long time. And uh, suddenly uh, we do something and most of the pain is gone. Now, I do not attribute that to a big, giant psychological change in one session. I attribute that to something happened within the musculoskeletal system. Something happened within the nervous system that went, oh, 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 I'm okay. Now, how that happened, I mean, I think that's going to be very difficult to ever parse out. But from my view, it's lots of different things. One, it's establishing a sense of, of, of safety that usually comes from the quality of the way that we explore with people. And so my own tone, my own hands, my own uh, rhythm, uh, my own belief in a person's uh, uh, in the in the my own belief that a person is whole. All this gets transmitted within a session to uh, another person. So there's there's a a kind of of influence going back and forth because humans, even over the internet, humans are always uh, entraining themselves to each other. And you show up in my classes or in my sessions agreeing to some degree to be entrained by my tone, my voice, my rhythm, and the words that I say. Also, you get put back at the same time in charge. You're told continually over and over again that it's it's okay not to do something that we say. It's okay to, to choose to do it differently. It's okay uh, if you stop in the middle of the session, it's okay if you say to me in a private session, I, I, I'm done, I don't want to do any more, or I don't want you to touch me 
here or it, can we do this differently or that doesn't feel comfortable so you become more in charge again you feel less out of control but also your muscular system it often starts to melt and when a muscular system starts to sort of melt and release chronic holding this means you're going to get better nerve conduction you're going to get better circulation you're going to have a greater state of availability and relaxation and definitely the safety thing comes into play again so i i really think that it's not all one thing when we're addressing most situations for people who come to us for pain and yes somebody might come right after an injury so actually i just got a call from a woman whose husband is she wants to give her appointment with me tomorrow to her husband because he hurt himself uh, not quite sure how but he stood too long and now can barely walk so that's more uh acute he just pretty much just happened to him but most people it's gone on for a while it's gone on for a while and maybe they've waited months or years or they've tried many things over those months or years before they show up so it's very chronic usually chronic gets uh diagnosed as chronic pain within just maybe three months uh, so i think it's it's such a difficult thing when you've tried so many approaches to usually usually most people start with physicians but not everybody does and so with a physician and you might have tried pain medications you might have had mris x-rays you might have done physical therapy you might have done uh ot you might have done massage therapy these these kinds of things where um someone else is trying to import part expert knowledge to you so that you can build up your strength or your flexibility or you can get re relaxation through the massage therapist's hands. Well, what's different for us in this somatic approach that we call the Feldenkrais method is not that we don't think that we know anything, but what we think is much more important than what we know is that you begin to know, that you begin to know how your body works, how your mind works, how you can learn to make all kinds of adaptations to movement that simple changes like a tiny little change in trajectory can allow you to suddenly be able to lift your arm with comfort then if you went here you might go Ugh, right Ugh. that doesn't mean that there may not be a problem that should still be addressed but it's hard to address problems when pain just hangs on and on and on and on and then it might also mean that there's not a problem that needs to be addressed i mean it, it goes both ways we're really complex these organic structures of, of, of being human it's a complex thing and uh, the pacing at which we can learn and get to know ourselves it has to be just right and it has to be just right for each person it has to be just right for each person some people will actually experience a lot of pain decrease in a single session we just finished the three-part live series which i think today is your last day to watch those replays and actually i know it is looking at the calendar today's the last day to watch those replays if you registered for my series for that you can still watch them today and people did report a decrease or an elimination of pain in one session uh, and it was all kinds of pain but there were plenty of people in the background that heard that and went well that didn't happen for me oh, it's not going to happen for me again and that's not true there people will improve and their own rate some pain difficulty challenges take longer there's more things that have happened to people's nervous systems there's more compensations or accommodations that have been built over time to unravel but often people can begin to start to notice something is improving even while they continue to have pain like oh i can reach a little better 
uh, but my left hip still hurts. But I wasn't even going for being able to reach better. I was going for my left hip, but oh, I can notice that I reach better. So there's precursors that can start to happen for people where they can start to notice different kinds of improvements uh, before their pain pattern starts to unravel. Now, there's also something else, at least in the way that I teach, that I think is really important, which is that we want to stop revolving around pain as the center of your life. Okay, so it's there. It's difficult to ignore, and I'm not really asking you to ignore it because I don't think that's healthy either, but, but we want to add more things to your life for you to focus on because if you just pay attention to pain, we do know that the nervous system gets better at producing more of it. It's just a natural function of your nervous system, of your brain to get better at what it does already a lot of. So we want to give it something else to do a lot of, and that can be noticing your breath. It can be noticing the sounds in the room. It can be noticing that your thumb feels just beautiful right now. Oh, look at that, that shape, right? The, the feel of the shape and the, and the, and the length of it. And, oh, there's something about the skin and the temperature. So maybe the left tip still hurts, but now we're giving the nervous system, the brain, some additional information that it can start to track on. And we can build on that week after week, lesson after lesson. And if you do something like join your learning body, um, my online membership, then you can actually build on it daily by doing small movement explorations each day, but then maybe once a week we're together in a class or you could even join a, a peer led group and get together at, at once a week to explore together. So there's so many options once you get into a, a, a program and a rhythm with my, with me, there's a lot of options. If you have any questions, by the way, please feel free to pop them in the comments or make it, um, or even, um, you might make a, uh, comment or disagree with something, that's fine too. I won't stay too much longer and I'll wrap it up because I got clients to see today. Um, but if you want to know about the program, it's actually closing tomorrow night, at, which is the 25th at midnight and will be closed for many months to come. So you might want to go check it out, yourlearningbody.com and find out what your options are especially if you're someone who's struggling with chronic pain, you're motivated. You are motivated. The challenge is, is believing, holding open even just like a little window of possibility of belief that it could happen for you. That's difficult if you've been at it for a long time. But my experience tells me it is possible. It doesn't mean every single difficulty goes away but it means that your life gradually starts to get better. You get a handle on how to live in a way that's more pleasing and easeful. You learn to take care of yourself. You learn to think, not just to move better. You learn to think better, which is another form of movement, but you learn to think better. And that doesn't mean I tell you what to think. I just lay out ideas, concepts, things for you to explore. And usually people just spontaneously start to report things like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't feel as bad about myself. I don't blame myself as much. Uh, I noticed how when I felt that pain in my knee, that then my thought went to catastrophic sort of thinking. And I, I could then start to talk to myself in a different way. So there's so many different options of how we learn to reconcile with where we're at and hold open the possibility of where we can go and then uh, are partnered with as we explore that journey that is the reversal of that spiral down, right? That spiral down that comes and then start to open that circle back up so that we can begin to spiral up and out into higher function again. 
it would be my pleasure to help you with that. And to hear more of those fantastic comments coming in about how they're feeling better. I want to say maybe something. I think I got a minute, a couple of minutes to say something about uh, some kinds of pain that are more challenging to work with, like fibromyalgia. I mean, this fibromyalgia is a great example of how little we understand about, about the human body and, and pain. And so something like fibromyalgia, it's not usually as simple. It usually takes a multifaceted approach, that one that uh, includes diet, may include some work in water, for example. Uh, it does include trying to find some regular movement, but movement that the person can do without causing flare-ups. So that's a, um, an, a, a, an exploration to be had. And, um, and there are many other things like fibromyalgia, which don't yield themselves to immediate quick fixes or may not yield themselves to feeling like uh, uh, you're going to get like a huge jump forward, but they are usually gradually able to be worked with. And so once people begin to feel uh, movement happening, even if it's up and down or in a direction, I always say one or 2% of movement for someone who's been struggling for so long, it really opens a pathway of hope. It opens a pathway of realistic hope. It's not just something that is pie in the sky because you have now felt that opening. You have felt what can happen. You have felt, oh, this is possible. And I generally believe that if it's possible for us once, it's possible for us again. So uh, it, it re reopens and reinvigorates uh, where our life can go if we keep engaging with it in a way that works for, works for us. Okay, I think I'll be going live again tomorrow. I haven't decided what topic, maybe even twice. So if you have a topic that you want me to pop in about and chat about, um, be, feel free to let me know, but I'll be planning it out soon and popping up there another opportunity to, to check in with me. Thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Hope you have a great, great day.